This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. It's Loud and Live from London with your host, Toby Doncaster, on the Thursday Twilight Show. Today, I'm with Rachel Powers discussing how to infuse joy in the GCSE English Retake Classroom. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out, with Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, everybody. So I'm afraid my guest still hasn't joined me. I'm hoping for the best. Uh, She's seeing the usual screen, so I'm just going to try and reset everything and see if that will get things working. So, uh, yeah, I'm just waiting for Rachel. and she should be joining me shortly. Um, oh, there she is. And I'm just going to invite her in. Hello. Oh, hello. 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 Rachel. We've done it. Are you ready? <laughs> I know. We had a, a slight issue on Monday, <laughs> but it's, it's working just fine today. So just to start off, um, how are you? I'm fine. I've recovered from the heat wave. Uh, yeah. Yeah, hot, wasn't it? Well, I grew up in Asia and uh, I find the heat, you know, quite uh, lovely, actually. I mean, it, it um, so, and then it, it, you know, it's just brilliant, basically, you know. Wow. You're I, the I just love it. Absolutely yeah. Opposite to me. I am a cold person. <laughs> so anyway, today we're, um, you know, I've invited you as a very, very special guest. Um, right. No, what it is, it's, it's your, um, it's your character, you know, I mean, you've done so many things, you've got a deep interest in English literature. And, uh, you know, your teaching experience stretches across secondary school, and now in further education. So really what we're looking at is how we can infuse joy into the GCSE retake yes. classroom for 16-year-olds, bearing in mind that, um, you know, what, what can I say? Students, I feel, right, that students that are coming into our classrooms at, you know, at 16 years old, you know, most of them have been failed by the education system because I don't think GCSE English is actually that difficult. Ah, I kind of might disagree uh, with some of that in that I I actually, for some of our students, it is. Um, You know, you've got a a huge uh, variety of... um, different cultures, different levels, you know, and and quite a few of these students who are quite new to the country or haven't been here that long, um, you know, 19th century literature is actually um, a very big deal for them to deal with, Um, you know, uh, uh, in in terms of how dense the vocabulary can be in some of those extracts. Yeah. Uh, You know, so I've had students reading a 19th century piece of work, and I think it was from The Woman in Black, one year um and um you know the dog was called spider and of course you know they couldn't understand the inference that it was a dog and of course they thought it was an actual spider so you know there's quite a lot of hurdles for um quite a lot of our students to overcome in terms of even understanding the extracts yeah i i saw that a mile away i i work with um uh, entry two and entry three uh sort of esol learners who are now doing you know vocational courses and um 
and GCSE English alongside, and they have such difficulty getting to the um, getting to the material as you have just yes. stated. Yes. Yeah, but just to kick off, then, how would you define joy in the classroom? What do you think oh, that stands for? Oh, wow, joy. Yeah. That's a big word. That has many levels to it, doesn't it? The word joy. Yeah. Um, and I suppose you'd have to think about on a philosophical level. Does what does joy mean and and what does that you know is, is is that the same for all of us or do we experience joy in different ways with different kind of stimuli so you know the idea in the classroom of of, of joy is, is is first of all is um you know i think i think one of the intrinsic things is i think joy is felt from sheer human uh, contact and communication mm -hmm. on a level where mm. you know that they they feel safe they feel yes, welcomed. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think it has to be, you know, in, in the classroom, it has to be a very level playing field. You know, I was taught some very valuable lessons from some really expert um, people over the years and some brilliant bosses. And, you know, I mean, I, I think for a start, safety is intrinsic. I think it's the idea that everybody needs to feel safe. And I think for your average teenager, I think that really mm. kicks off with relationships. I think relationships... Um, have to be built um, with students to make them feel um, they are part of and to make them feel um, that, you know, that, that, that their, their opinion and their ideas are valued uh, in, uh, at whatever stage. And I, I think, I think um, you know, I, I, I think building relationships for, for the idea of mm. is absolutely number one. I mean, you've mentioned this building relationships, and we've also touched on the fact that some of our students don't quite understand what's going on. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, how can we do that then? How can we sort of build bridges um, while people still don't quite understand what's going on? Yeah, I think, I mean, for, you know, for instance, you get a variety of different kinds of students within a classroom. We've got a lot of EAL and a lot of SEND students. So you have to be kind of like, um, be, you know, reach out to people, I think, on a cultural level as well, is I think one of the ways you can bring joy to EAL students is, you know, for, for them to feel that their their cultures are valued. You mm. know, so, so maybe introduce things into the classroom in some way, which they can respond to immediately, which they recognize. So if you're dealing with a beginner student that might have just come over here with traumatic experiences and their day to day life was virtually trying to survive. You know, and they come into a classroom and they're kind of like, you know, um, faced with a, a, a GCSE. I think for a start, you, they have to feel that they are included and part of, um, you know, that environment. So one of the things I used to do was, um, you know, when I was working in the EAL department, was to kind of ensure that, you know, we had things that were put into the lesson that made them feel part of. So, for instance, I mean, it's a silly example, but, I mean, I have a, an interest in horror, okay? So, I, okay, I, like, okay. So I like vampires, okay? And I had a Romanian, and it was just a kind of tenuous link, but it was the idea of starting a conversation with them about Dracula and about, um, and about Romania. And, and I, I learned um, uh, a couple of uh, Romanian words, you know, that represented vampire, and they responded kind of immediately. <laughs> Um, you know, and it was quite lucky because at the time you could kind of then, you know, introduce Dracula in as a piece of text, you know, and that was just sort of one example of kind of like trying to make sure. And also, you know, doing things like uh, when we had uh, uh, PowerPoints, you know, to try and include vocabulary from other cultures into that as well. Um, mm -hmm. I, I am very, I mean, I'm painfully aware of time being an issue. You know, when you are dealing with a GCSE, the turnaround uh, for a year is extremely fast. Um, and there's so many things that you want to kind of do, but very little quick ideas can be very effective. Because uh, I think, you know, to do with joyous inclusivity, you know, so kind of like to try and in involve other, you know, um, fantastic things like, you know, bringing food in from other cultures, you know, sort mm -hmm. of like, you know, sort of like introducing people to the different kind of dishes. And trying to be inventive in English is trying to embed these kind of ideas into the actual lesson itself. Um, when you choose text, you know, maybe trying to be mindful of what kind of text that you're choosing to study, where they can feel sort of part of as well. That's mainly to do with the EAL sector. 
So I like the idea of including other cultures in the classroom. Yes. Um, and I could I could almost see that sort of like you know sort of like the first few lessons really tell me about yourself yes. create a magazine article yeah. you know put in some photos um I, I i i love the idea of creativity as well in the classroom and i think that that's sort of yeah that's one bridge that can be built you know getting uh, students to start using their creativity and not necessarily focus so much on writing at a GCSE level. Yeah, and I think yeah. sound. I mean, you know, another thing is like to, to try and make students involved is, is, is the idea of sound uh, using effects. Um, you know, so people, so we, you know, they can overcome vocabulary and immediately. I mean, for example, with EAL, is the idea of introducing, re, I think it was called realia which is bringing, right. object, bringing objects into the classroom. Yeah. And very much, you know, if you're going to, like, discuss, I don't know, say Hamlet, you know, I um, mean, you know, it sounds a bit of bringing in a skull or something. <laughs> like that. Um, but the, the idea of bringing objects in and kind of like sort of using that as a base point to then develop, um, you know, sort of like um, um, I... I am uh, I am using headphones at the moment. Yes, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, yes. fine, fine, oh, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So to introduce kind of like objects into the classroom, which they might immediately recognise, which you can link to kind of what you're teaching. Sound. I actually discovered they quite liked when they were studying some of them not to have silence. So was maybe what that was to introduce um, kind of uh, a sound they could relate to and liked, and introducing sound into whatever you're actually studying. You know, just really little things, you know, maybe if you were doing a language paper too and it was both uh, focusing on cars or motorbikes, you know, maybe mm. having at the beginning of the lesson sort of like the sounds of the city. Um, it, it, they're just very quick things. So people who are struggling with, you know, some of these really difficult vocabulary um, can sort of relate immediately to what's happening. And joy can come from that idea because everybody wants to feel... Um, you know, they want to feel safe and they don't yeah, want to be yeah. frightened of English. And I think what you come up against with students is fear at times because they think it's, it's, a, it's a big mountain to climb when it actually isn't. Imagine having your own instructional coach available 24-7. Now you can with the teaching how-tos platform. This highly personalised social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers, or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques, designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the How To app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support and embracing technology. We're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations. Easy for you, transforming education, one device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou.school This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Hi teachers, we're Apps for Good and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. 
our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. Uh, we've been talking about, you know, allowing creativity to take place in the classroom, building bridges, creating a safe environment for learners, particularly those with language issues, trying to grapple with GCSE level English. But what can we do with um, the disaffected, if you like, those that have already um, been through the school system? Yeah, yeah, you get quite a few. I mean, at the moment, you get quite a few sort of level threes. I mean, I think it's the level three, level four boundary that's the most difficult is making that, it's that little leap that they have to make into that, just that 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 pass. Um, I mean, one one experience I had was uh, was back in secondary, and I, and I was given a class of all boys. Um, <laughs> it was a year nine class, and they were. <laughs> it was very much an infamous class. They'd all been kind of put into this class with me, and um, you know that you know you got quite a lot of fear around the building <laughs> whenever anybody had to teach them. And oh dear. I, and I kind of discovered that um you know as well as being creative building relationships is absolutely essential because you found that a happy student is in a good mindset to want to learn and can absorb information a student normally i found in my experience that behavior is born out of fear that they don't understand mm. what's going on that they're trying to mask what's going on that they're frightened that they don't want to be shown up in front of the peer group things like that um so i just phoned um that these these students were known in the school for, for behavior issues and were constantly in trouble the phone calls home were normally of a nature where they'd done something wrong and you know it, it and, and and the parents then got disaffected and I think this, the, the, the idea of this being disaffected definitely comes from the home as well. And that if a parent is tired of hearing the same phone calls that her son, mm. yeah. So I yeah. just phoned every single parent um, on that list, and I just, you know, it was courtesy call to introduce myself, but it was also to make sure that every week I made a phone call to say something very positive yes. about their son or daughter. And the difference that made was enormous. The students that were normally sort of expected to get into trouble, get the normal C1, C2, C3s, a lot of the time these didn't actually work with these students. The tensions didn't work. Uh, well, the one key thing that worked was getting the parent uh, on board with you so the, the child felt immediately valued as soon as they came into the room. And what then happened was is the students slowly started, to, that's where they started to build a relationship with me was through the parent. That they, that, and I made sure that they got, um, you know, a, an award system. Um, oh, yeah. And, and, it, and it kind of really developed then. And they came in and I kind of like, you know, I let, I let them express themselves a bit more freely than usual because, you know, they were, they were in a, a tricky classroom, not, not too freely. But, you know, the fact is, um, you know, joy also came from the fact that, you know, bad behavior is not simply down to the fact they just want to behave badly. They might not have slept that night. They might not have eaten. You know, there was a whole ream of things that could be going on. So I would ask them at the end of a lesson, I just, you know, if one had been particularly tricky, I'd kind of like take them to one side and just ask them, you know, did you sleep? Did you eat? You know, things like that. And I, th I found that the, um, the idea of joy also comes from the idea of being safe is, is caring. Um, not not crossing the line where I'm not going to be their mother, obviously, but like no. to you know to to make sure that the welfare of the student is at the top of my mind when I am teaching them, um, and that they then that that's then how they form the link with you, and the parent is in the, in a much better frame of mind then to receive your phone calls and to be able to talk in a more free manner to you about what's going on. Yeah, I think you know. There, there is a lot to be said about the, uh, I call it the praise phone call, because um, I started doing that as well. And the results were 
immediate you know that you know i sort of make the call and i say hello you know it's your um your son or your daughter's uh, english language teacher oh yes yeah <laughs> i just wanted to say you know how pleased i am and uh, you know i wanted to say how pleased i am with your yeah. son's performance today he yeah. did this I mean, and did absolutely. that absolutely i'm a yeah. parent and i, I know when yeah. my son was in school i really back because he was he was quite a handful at times to be honest. <laughs> um and um you know there were times oh, there, were, there were the teachers that knew how to handle him and there were the teachers that you know where he uh, didn't connect very well and I, I remember that I really when he got a well done card or when he got you know uh, I got a phone call about him he, it worked wonders for me as a parent as well mm. I felt great and um, and it also boosts their self-esteem and confidence because I think what else is key is when they come in and they've got to retake it again they, their self-esteem and confidence could be very low um, yes. They could have had a teaching experience which was not enjoyable to them. They, you know, there, there could be a hundred reasons why, you know, they, they, they've come back in and they're retaking it again. And they've got this mindset of what English is in their mind where they might not have had a good experience um, and they're expecting to get that again. So there, there's a bit of unravelling work to do. They're also mm. under tremendous amounts of pressure. It's not just English. They've got a myriad of other things going on. So it, it is about being inventive, uh, building relationships and, um, you know, kind of like trying to reach out, you know. But uh, also, I'm, I understand as a teacher, I have a lot to get through and I have a big turnaround. So I have to keep that also at the uppermost of my mind as well. So, yeah, talking about the, uh, the amount of learning that uh, the uh, students have to do yeah. um i'm just wondering you know what, what can we do to 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 chunk it if you like or to yeah. break it down for them or something um you know, there's the question of homework you know if only everybody would do some homework you know and do a bit yeah. of self-studying yeah. a bit of autonomy there you know would actually help um we've got a few people in the audience as well and i was wondering you know okay. How do you spread joy? You know, whether there's any comments there that yeah. we could, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, you know. any, anything that's of use to me, fantastic. To exactly. Us. So how, I mean, do you, do you give texts, you know, sort of um, what I'm trying to say is, do you give texts cold or do you, how do you chunk them down? Do you chunk them down? Do you, you see, break them is, down for them? This is it. I mean, because we have a fast turnaround, I mean, the two major things on my mind, you know, right from the get-go is language and structure. Because language and structure, of course, are for me the biggest features in those papers. Um, and so it's kind of getting a handle on them as quickly as possible. I do find chunking it down acronyms incredibly useful. Um, mm. You know, so soap maps, you know, for... Um, you know, just learning the acronyms for soap maps or Indo Forest or Kinder Forest or whatever anybody's <laughs> using. It's really funny. There was once a CPD ages ago I had at a school where they were like saying acronyms, you know, or I don't know, there was something that came in that said acronyms don't work. And oh, I was okay. really shocked by that because for me, acronyms absolutely worked. It was kind of like they, they were able to kind of have a, an image or an idea in their mind. Uh, which would immediately uh, have memory recall attached to it. So they could straight away. So I think chunking it down is like, I'm a big acronym person. I do like them. Um, the students kind of take to them as well. So it's kind of like, um, you know, chunking it down is trying to give them quick, easy, accessible things that they can get, get into straight away. So if they are presented with language, they know straight away soap maps or whatever the acronym mm, is. Mm, mm. Uh, so that's just a, that's just a way in. I mean, you'll get students that are quite high level that kind of have these yes. concepts straight away. And the other big challenge is, of course, is trying to meet the needs of all the, the students within the classroom. So um, quick, quick ways of, of going in effect analysis, philosophical, que philosophical questions, you know, the mm. opportunity to uh, talk about effects to talk about you know how does that make you feel but the students were always quite strong at that because when I taught groups before they were kind of like what what was termed as the you know the, the 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 students who were not achieving so much you got them into philosophical debate and mm. they were incredibly uh, clued up 
it was extraordinary. You know, you present, present them with the idea of Jekyll and Hyde, you know, is there such a thing as evil? Or So I think um, giving them access into language paper one ideas is maybe getting into philosophical uh, kind of debates or questions about whatever text is being used. And that kind of like ticks the box for me of analysis and effect, which is something that they're going to have to discuss on those papers. So, yeah, I, you've mentioned something there that I've picked up on, which is that, um, you know, our students are extremely insightful, mm. you know, and if we could tap into that, you know, that would be something. To, so, we, <laughs> you know, just to recap, you know, we've got being creative, making a safe space, yeah. building bridges. And then finally, you know, what do you think? How does this make you feel? You know, what and why do you think that way based on what you're reading at the yes. moment? Yes. I think it's the like this, the, the uh, do you know what? I can't remember this. It's very embarrassing. I'm sure one of your callers know immediately what it is. What, how, who? It's kind of like it's um, I, I used to call it like um. The analogy I used to give was like a detective. I would say so. The, one of the I always do this story with the students. I say, right, the good, the bad detective comes into the room. There's a dead body in the middle of the floor, and they say there's a dead body in the middle of the floor. So it's trying to understand yeah. um, explicit reading. Now, obviously, I'm very aware that on the language papers, implicit reading gets you slightly higher level. So it's the idea of encouraging them to be detective. And then I'm saying, and then the good detective comes into the room. There's a dead body in the floor, but the, he doesn't state that. He immediately starts looking for clues. He mm. has a hunch, and the hunch is your analysis, your effect, your feelings. Um, but then you've got to start gathering your evidence. You know, what time did he leave? Was there anybody else here? You've got to get, you know, sort of uh, find your witnesses. You know, so it's kind of like trying to encourage them in along the line of being a, de a detective and trying to get. So I always kind of like me. I'm always um, forever coming out with that to the students as a way of them trying to read under the surface of a text, which I think in a lot of cases, that's the thing that kind of might just prevent them from getting into those fours and higher is being able to implicitly read. Mm. You know, you've just given me a thought. I, I imagine a classroom where, you know, uh, we, we could play this as a game. So Yeah, you, I did. You, it. it's, it's great. Yeah. <laughs> you get one of the students to lie on the floor. Well, not lie on the floor. Just, like, just sort of like use it as an example and sort of like maybe use absolutely as a game, like the rest of them are detectives and need to find out, you know. Um, ha, ha, you know what happened, how it happened, why yeah. it happened. But I was you also know. thinking, you know, you know, you could have witnesses, and these witnesses have, you know, a, a clue or a piece of information yes, that they can absolutely. give to you if you talk to. So again, it goes back to that creativity and yes, um, trying to think, you know, out of the box and trying to think, okay, how can I make this more engaging, more interesting? Absolutely. And, how can I give you something that you've never experienced in the English classroom? Absolutely. I think games are absolutely key. Um, yeah. I wish I had more time to develop them. I had this most amazing line manager. He was such a progressive thinker. And he was absolutely resolute. He, he actually got students creating their own games around what we were kind of studying. Um, oh. And he, he was incredibly... Um, you know, very influential with me. He just had a way of kind of bypassing all the kind of usual techniques I would use to try and teach and then getting frustrated because it wasn't quite happening. <laughs> and, and he just had a way of coming in and uh, engaging the students through the use of games. And he got them to create them. I mean, he used to run lunchtime lessons on creating a robotic arm, which moved about. And, and, um, you know, with Raspberry Pi and, and, and you know, uh, like how, how to be using Python. So he's very interested in the IT side of it. But he was, it, it, games were like absolutely, uh, I, I, one of the things I really like I did lately with them actually was prepositions. So, okay. you know, you've got lots of them that don't know what prepositions are. So they all stood up and like, you know, I sort of went under and we actually physically, I, I gave them orders on what to do, go under the desk, over the desk, you stand next to the desk. 
um, beneath the desk, <laughs> in front of the desk. And um, and they really enjoyed it. I mean, obviously, you have to keep this right handle on it because some people want to go completely out of control. <laughs> um, but it was, uh, yeah, just that sort of phys a physical activity. Obviously, I can't do masses of it, but it's the idea of um, illustration through games is really good. You've mentioned games and you've mentioned um, physical activity. And I think that's something that we don't quite think of. You know, it's like coming to the class, here is the text, you know, here's a vocabulary exercise. Yeah. Now sit down and sit there for an hour and a half. Yeah. And, you know, we've really got to give uh, learners a chance to get up, to move around, to stretch, yes. you know, maybe to maybe to look around as well and see yes. if there's anything new and exciting out there that they could be, that, you know, some more information that they could be taking in. Yes. And I, I love the idea of gamification. Um, I'm a fan of ed tech because it, it makes gamification simple. Right. Um, but um, what other sort of physical activities can you can you suggest off the top of your head? Well, they really like um, um, a lot of the time. I mean, they, 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 for closed questions, I think last man standing is something I've always enjoyed, you know, where you get them all to stand up. Um, some people use it as an exit card, actually, um, oh, okay. at the end of the class to, as, as a very quick, effective way of checking on um, learning or how much they've taken in. So last man standing, they all stand up, of course, and like for each student, student that you, then you ask them, you know, a closed question or, or you recap in the class by asking them a question. If they get it right, obviously they sit down for last man standing. But I know some people use it as an exit. So last man standing is where they also, and they ask a question on something that's taken place in the class and then they can leave, you know, mm. like, as soon as they get one. So, and also I just, they just like, they like um, that kind of thing. You know, they like the sort of, uh, um, I think physicality is important to the point. I remember that they used to do things like put, you know, using the walls, you know, sort of like so yes. they had to pick up clues, you know, putting things onto walls, um, you know, the round robin of tables, you know, so moving students onto another table to add information or whatever to whatever you're working on. So it was, so I think you're absolutely right. I think, um, you know, when you've got them at a particular time, particularly after lunch, when they're pretty fractious, you know, and, mm. and um, is is the idea of them sort of like of, of um them that absolutely move they being able to move because you get very different types of learners the way you get kinesthetic, uh, I all three of them, all all the three learners. Well, yeah. There's there's loads of uh, what what they call learning styles. I'm I'm not too sure if I buy into that, you know. Um, yeah, I do. I understand. I, just, I yeah. understand totally what you mean. I think um, I didn't do enough in-depth research on it myself mm. you know how effective that actually is but I, I i i would definitely say that um some learners are definitely more practical than others yes so the idea that de definitely them having something solid or something to manipulate you know on a, on a real level you know um definitely but i think an hour and a half in our class yeah that's a long that's a long old it is talk. a long stretch and, yeah. I, and i and i do over talk so i'm very aware that especially if you're trying to think i've got to scrunch quite a lot in here so definitely <laughs> i think what a lesson for self is to try and break it up with one physical activity so the prepositions uh, one i did try which worked really well doing something like that definitely imagine having your own instructional coach available 24 7. now you can with the teaching how to's platform this highly personalised social platform empowers busy teachers to learn and apply evidence-based teaching techniques, either independently, working collaboratively with their peers, or with our new AI assistant. The platform features over 160 visual guides to teaching techniques, designed to help you quickly and easily implement high-impact practices that boost student engagement and improve learning outcomes. Join over 200 institutions worldwide that are elevating their teaching practices with the How To app. No gurus, just practical support anytime you need it. Interested in finding out more? Visit teachinghowtos.com and register for our next webinar. Empowering education with Easy For You, where innovation meets accessibility. Our subscription-based offering not only equips schools with cutting-edge devices, but revolutionizes the learning experience. 
by eliminating financial barriers, streamlining support and embracing technology, we're not just providing tools. We're shaping a future where every student can thrive, unburdened by limitations, easy for you, transforming education, one device at a time. Find out more at www.easyforyou.school. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, publishers of professional development books and resources that support great teaching and learning in schools around the world. Don't miss out. Level up your professional development today and visit johncatbookshop.com to explore the full range of titles. Use the code JCTTR2425 for 20% off your order. Happy reading. Hi, teachers. We're Apps for Good and we give schools like yours free introductory computing courses. Our courses are for everyone, including those who aren't computing teachers, and they're fully equipped with resources mapped to the UK computing curriculum. Independent learning is central to our courses. Your students will develop essential and digital skills by working in teams to create prototype apps for good. We'll even connect you with industry volunteers to give real-world feedback. Let's empower every young person you teach to shape their future with technology. Speak to us at www.appsforgood.org. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. Teachers and GPs are staggering under extra demands caused by poverty, according to a report in The Guardian. Desperate families, unable to afford food, clothing or heating, are increasingly turning to education and health services for help. New research has shown what, for many, has long been understood through anecdotal evidence. Namely, that teachers and GPs are acting as welfare advisors, housing officers and social workers alongside the day job. The study by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation also found that some teachers and GPs were providing toys and books as well as basic essentials as such as food and clothing for children. Poverty campaigners have warned that the situation is now urgent. The study found that a third of schools and almost half of GP surgeries had set up a food bank. 44% of pupils were estimated to have come to school hungry and health and education staff were dipping into their own pockets to help the others. Education staff said resources were being devoted to firefighting poverty and issues linked to it, but that meant less time and energy being spent on teaching. The report features a case study on a school in Manchester, and full details can be found on the Guardian website. The BBC News website has focused again on funding for special educational needs, with councils in England forecasting a massive shortfall in budgets. The BBC has found councils face a deficit of almost £1 billion, with signs that the gap between funding and spending is continuing to increase. Parent groups have focused on the difficulty in obtaining an education, health and care plan. They believe that without one, it's much harder to get specific support. Almost 600,000 children and young people now have an EHCP in England and last year saw a 26% year-on-year increase. The growing demand is something councils are struggling to meet and campaign groups expressed concern that some now have very little focus on children's needs because they're worried about the financial bottom line. The NAHT union has called for any new government to write off councils' accumulated deficits in SEND but none of the mainstream parties address funding of SEND directly in their manifestos. The Conservatives have promised 15 more special schools. Labour promised to increase early interventions and mainstream support. The Lib Dems said they would establish a national body for SEND funding to be managed. And the Greens say they would push for £5 billion of investment for mainstream schools. Full details, along with a series of linked stories, can be found on the BBC website. Schools Week have focused on Labour's manifesto promise to scrap single-word Ofsted judgments and replace the current system with a report card 
telling parents clearly how schools are performing. There have been very few details, however, of what this could actually look like. The Schools Week report considers a wide range of options for the scorecard, having asked a range of stakeholders for their views on what information it could or should contain. Labour has promised to consult the sector on its plans. It's likely that changes would require a new inspection framework and some changes to current legislation, which would delay plans changes for around a year. Full details of the discussion can be found on the Schools Week website. In Louisiana, USA, every public school classroom has been ordered to display a poster of the Ten Commandments, according to a report on the BBC News website. It is the first measure of its kind in the US and applies to all classrooms in the state up to university level. Opponents to the move say the law breaks America's separation of church and state, protected by the First Amendment to the US Constitution. In 1980, the US Supreme Court struck down a Kentucky law, similar to the Louisiana law, which required the Ten Commandments to be displayed in elementary and high schools. Finally, the BBC also reports on calls by the National Secular Society for a school in Wales to be investigated after it allegedly promoted creationism. The NSS is calling for a ban on teaching creationism as it undermines teaching about evidence-based theories such as evolution. The teaching of creationism as a scientific theory is banned in England, but the promotion of it is not prohibited in Wales. A Welsh government spokesperson said, Community schools are not permitted to have a religious leaning, and we are in discussions with the relevant local authority. Full details of this story can be found in the education section of the BBC News website. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. And we're back again. So we've been looking at promoting creativity in the classroom and uh, building a safe environment and, uh, you know, activities, getting students to walk around, move around. but. We've just heard on the news, you know, there was a little uh, snippet there about food banks for students and, you know, families living in poverty. And I was just wondering whether this is something that we have probably facing, um, you know, in further education. Yes, I mean, absolutely. It, it, is, um, it is a crisis. I, I, and this isn't recent. I mean, I, I had a situation back in secondary school. Um, you know where, and and I've seen it in the college, in the college. You know whereby, um, you know students are, are um, some students are really suffering. I had an instance of one one of the, my year nine boys, at the time, and his mother was um, being evicted. You oh, know, no. and, and and as a and as a teacher, um, I, I I you know I went straight to my seniors about the situation and we discussed you know I think I think you know the pastoral team were brilliant and you know and thank goodness for pastoral teams you know because it because it is it is particularly bad now you know I've, I've seen quite a lot and I've been in the education sector about 15 years and in that time I have seen uh, uh you know quite a few students have come to school not eating um mm. you know making sure they're fed making sure they get lunches um uh, not able to afford school uniforms um, you know, um, it, it, it is pretty uh, horrendous. I've seen a, a particularly a dreadful tragedy occur at, at school. I mean, it, it's, it's been, yeah, I, and I do think um, the idea that uh, as a teacher, absolutely, I'm an educator, but also um, I feel that, you know, how on earth can you learn, you know, in a classroom when you have all of that going on? Exactly. And I mean, I'm just wondering, you know, hopefully, you know, the government's going to take notice of all of this, that, you know, it's <laughs> basically it's affecting the bottom line. You know, learners are not going to achieve, you know, education is not going to take place. Um, learners are going to act up because they're they're angry and hungry and tired and unable to concentrate, Absolutely. you know. Um, so that's one one side to look at, you know, which is, you know, how how we're going to care and support uh, learners. And um, I think, you know, there's there's call there for 
a very strong sort of safeguarding team to look after learners and to ensure that their needs are being met. Um, apart from changing um, activities to keep their interest going, what other things do you do? And bearing in, you know, like I said, bearing in mind that um, learners are suffering, you know, what what can we do to help them in the classroom to 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 stay energetic? Well, I've got to say, one thing I left off the list, of course, was trips. Yes. Which is, you know, I mean, I, I and 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 also kind of like everybody going on the trip. You know, I have ah. situations at schools where they've kind of said, well, we can't take so-and-so because of this or that. And I, I mean, I didn't have that experience. At the last place I worked at, you know, I was supporting a boy with an extraordinary amount of needs. He, he, he could not, um, he, you know, he, he just could not do classrooms at all. He, he, he had terrible difficulty. He, he had a, he had a reputation around the building, you know, for, for uh, and, and, which was unfair, really, but it, it, it was there. And um, and he came out on a trip, and I and, and we fought for him to come out on the trip, and he came out on the trip, and it was a different boy. Mm. He was a different boy. He apps and and learning doesn't for me it can extend beyond the classroom. You know, it's the idea of like you know I've I've been on trips, uh, arranged trips for you know a, a bunch of us to go to the theatre, you know, to just go uptown. I mean, this was just to a museum, and they kind of you know edu education is everywhere, learning is everywhere. And I think, you know, sort of like the idea of them uh, doing something, you know, and obviously connected to maybe the curriculum that you're doing absolutely or connected to the same ideas. And I think, you know, for someone that's going through a tough time or difficult time, it's just the idea of like, you know, maybe they haven't got the money to go up town. Maybe mm. they haven't got the money mm. to go. They, they can't get to the museums. They can't, you know, they, they, they this is about get, getting out with them and giving them a new experience which might be able to carry them over, you know, to the next day to, to feel that they, they had a really great day, that they enjoyed themselves, but also they learned, they learned something. And it's another opportunity to build relationships. So trips, I, I, I think they're, you know, I would definitely put them high in the list of the idea of joy. Yeah, you know, yes. Can, yeah, we're, we're cycling back to that. With one student who just does not take to you at all. And I've been out on a trip with them, and by the end of the day, <laughs> you know, we're talking away on the train together. So yes. It's like, and it's also, also a, a great opportunity to, to see us in a different context as well, you know, to sort of like be able to get out of the classroom and for, for that. And, you know, I just think, I think that's a, that's a top priority one as well, isn't it? A trip. <sighs> What sort of trips do you think sort of connect to English? Because, I mean, for me, you know, um, as I said, I, I sort of grew up in Asia. And when I came here, I was 15. Yeah. And I had a love for Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. So I, I, I sort of went, <laughs> I went wild in London, basically. I was walking all over the place. Yeah. Um, I took the Metropolitan Line from Uxbridge to, um, yeah. to Baker Street. Yeah. To, you know the, the metropolitan line this is it you know the first yeah. the first tube in in the country sort of thing um you know uh and i i loved sort of walking down cobbled lanes yeah. in london because yeah. it was just like this is what you know this is what sherlock holmes experienced yeah so what so in your mind then what sort of modern uh maybe something that we could get learners interested in to read and to sort of, you know, yeah. what's, what's current, what's hip? Oh, well, uh, what's current and what's hip? I mean, in my experience, it was largely when I went on a trip, it was connected to uh, a literature text we were studying. Um, Theatre was, uh, uh, you know, uh, there, there, were, there were plenty of workshops that mm. were created around London to go to to consolidate learning. Uh, for GCSE, I think if we do with language papers, it's a slightly different ball game because, of course, the students that we've been teaching, of course, at the moment, it's just language. So it's That's right. Yeah. Not the GCSE literature. So, in terms of language, I suppose you'd be looking to try and give them um, an interesting point, different experience. I mean, you know, just for pure. <laughs> I was going to say a breakout room, but you wouldn't really learn anything from that. It was a tremendous fun. It's a real, it's a real team building thing. I was, I was useless, of course. You know, I was kind of, everybody was over one side of the room, and I was like obsessing about this tiny clue, which went absolutely nowhere. 
Uh-huh. Hours, but, um, but I, I think sort of like, I think just for, for, for some of them, it's literally like, exactly like you described. It would just be going to London and experiencing um, diff, you know, the different kind of exhibitions. Because bearing in mind, exactly like you discussed, a lot of our students haven't really seen London. I, I, no. I mean, in terms of a learning opportunity for, for language, uh, that'd be interesting. I mean, line like that. I mean, as British Library, or I don't know. So, but but mm. I, I, we would have to link it in some way. So if we were doing like language paper one, creative writing, uh, an opportunity to go to somewhere in London where they are exposed to. And I, you talked about it, Sherlock Holmes as a particularly literary figure. Um, I don't know. What do you think, Toby? I, you know, thinking along those lines, it was just <laughs> because I teach boys, it was Jack the Ripper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then, you know, London Walk. London Walk. Exactly. Exactly that. No, take them out of the classroom. And, yeah. then, and then, but also you mentioned breakout rooms and I thought about it and it comes back to that sort of, you know, back to language again, back to, you know, if you read this right, if you, if you get you the answer to right. communicate with each other yeah. effectively to get out of the room. Yeah. Um, and that was absolutely true. I mean, I was, I was with a, with a bunch of adults doing it, you know, all educators and you, 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 you and you learn how, to, how powerful words are. And how powerful communication and you speak as you write so it'd be an opportunity to improve um you know to have speaking opportunities i mean even maybe going to going to parliament i mean i often talk to my students about question time and whatever you know about the mm. language, you know language papers to start watching the news start watching houses of parliament debate start watching question time and maybe you know and going going to see a debate at parliament i mean you can get into the house of commons i went on there a trip once and you can go up into the galleries and you can actually watch wow. them having, and I think that is incredibly valuable for paper two, for persuasive transactional writing, and, and you know, uh, like you know, to get to get them into the idea of like formal language and how it's used, you know. So like, so that that kind of idea might be great. You know, go go to the, go to Parliament, go to the House of Commons. But also, you know, thinking about well, you know, they're sixteen, so thinking about employability as yeah. well you know what 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 is your future what does your, what could your future look like yeah. and then how can we sort of involve employers going to see employers do it i've yeah. be, because i work with uh, the motor vehicle department i've always thought you know my dream would be to take them to a bmw showroom say you know yes. and and get them to see how you know, salespeople work, you know. Um, you know, a hundred percent. I remember like when my dad was growing up, you know, they had a they had a bunch of students that weren't weren't interested in the car. They they got a car they got a used car in. Oh, okay. And they got them to rebuild this entire car. You know, so like to learn all these these kind of practical practice tools. I'm absolutely with you there. I think it's about their career path and it's about kind of aiming for places where they can have kind of direct experience with things. Absolutely. So, you know, well, I mean, we're thinking along the lines of being practical, you yeah. know, we've thought about breakout rooms, um, linking language to, you know, practical aspects such as going to the Houses of Parliament, seeing seeing how people use how language. How language is used to persuade. How language is but also, yeah, exactly, you know, like a showroom, you know, that would be the same thing. Yes. Wow. And that would it's that would corner at Hyde Park, you know, yeah. can, like you know, so they're exposed to kind of language because in the panic of an exam, you know, it's about how the immediacy as well is how much can you kind of bring to mind. They can they can see the idea of immediacy. They can they can look at people that are like got up on a soapbox and are actually speaking to the public straight away. So the idea of public speaking, taking them to places where people have to persuade you public speak is a linked paper too without question. I'm just wondering, you know, they'll they'll see people being heckled as well, well that's it. I mean, <laughs> and the banter kind of takes place days, and all that. You know, where they like, you know, in the, in the, where they could throw tomatoes at the stage. No. <laughs> I mean, I have to mention the Globe is a fantastic opportunity. You know, if they wanted to see kind of like you know the idea of like you know like being able to actually mingle in, down in the you know down on the, the groundlings, I think they're called. You know, uh -huh. and kind of like. <laughs> 
you've given me so many ideas. It's it's crazy. I, I, well, do you we've know got, what? We've got to implement some of them, haven't we? I mean, exactly. You know, held accountable now <laughs> <laughs> i think i think it's going to work i think this is going to be i know it's the end of the year and we're sort of sort you know petering down sort of yes. you know um putting tools to rest and stuff but i think you know there's 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 lots there that could be planned and could be used you know yes. um with learners and to yes. see them engage more to be more interested in what the, the power of English. That's and, it. That's, uh, it's the power of words. It's literally, yeah. absolutely. You say people, and it's unfortunate that they do, but people really judge you on how you use words and your communication. And, and and words are very, very powerful. And if you can master how you use them, you're kind of king of the world or queen of the world. For yes, you are indeed. Wow. And on that note, Rachel, look at that. You know, we've gone from joy. You know, what does joy bring? Joy, joy brings we power. We, Toby. Yeah. But I like the idea that joy brings about power and it brings empowerment, empowerment. and it brings strength, Absolutely. you know. Absolutely. And we've been it discussing. Brings safety, it brings empathy. You yes. Know, learning, learning to be empathic. Uh, I, I'm just a bit read books. You know, that's the first portal call is right. It's people always say to me, How do I improve my English? I say the fastest way for you to improve your English is to read books. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly that. Well, we'll go for a trip to the local library, get some yeah. books out, you know, and, and expose them as much to books as possible. Wow. This has been a lovely talk. Rachel, thank you, thank you so much uh, for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate it. Thank Thank you for inviting me. I've loved it. <laughs> and uh, like I said, hopefully I've got a couple of ideas. I'm going to see a change in uh, in in the classroom. You've yeah. brought about a new hope. <laughs> well, I've, I've, you now got to hold me accountable for some of these ideas. So I, I, I now have a checklist in my head. Uh, I'm not doing that. Right. So I've got to put my money where my mouth is. You know? yeah. Right. But thank you again and see you in the new term, hopefully. See you in the new term, Toby. And thank you very much for asking me on your show. Not at all. Take care now. Bye bye. And you. Bye bye now. Bye. Bye bye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.